welcome to another episode of the Plowcast, where we're discussing articles and ideas from the most recent issue of Plow, Creatures, the Nature Issue. I'm Susanna Black, Senior Editor at Plow. And I'm Peter Momsen, Editor of the Plow Quarterly. If you're new to this podcast, this is one episode of a six-part series where we also speak to our contributors and answer listener questions. We also talk to uh, just interesting guests who we invite on. If you have a question you'd like t- us to discuss, let us know on Twitter with a hashtag, hashtag Book of Creatures, or email us at info at plow.com. First up today, we'll, we'll, we will be talking about a piece by Mary Harrington, a contributor from Bedfordshire, England, where she reflects on the cost of the trend towards finding romance in the digital marketplace. What's for sale on online dating sites? And later we'll be talking with Plow contributing editor Leah Labresco Sargent about her essay in the issue, Let the Body Testify, where she asked the question, is our worth rooted in our existence as living bodies or as disembodied wills? So, Pete, let's get started. Okay, with Mary Harrington's beautiful piece where she begins by telling us uh, where the shambles is. Right. So she uh, describes her the little market town that she lives in in England as very sort of um, organized, orderly, and uh, there is a little sort of um, building in the middle of the town. And she said that that's the spot where the shambles used to be. The shambles uh, is essentially the public slaughterhouse slash uh, the parallel that she makes is to wet markets, which have been in the news a good bit this year. Um, But this is where you would go and you would take your animal to get it slaughtered. This is the very Bedfordshire version of the famous Wuhan wet market. That is correct. Um, And in that shambles, I guess, this public marketplace, uh, you can just imagine the the animals, the probably vegetables, the blood and literal blood and guts running down the street as you went to pick up um, your lamb or your fish or whatever it was rabbit mm-hmm. there's some beautiful um dutch paintings of shambles <laughs> oh uh, they, i don't know what they call them in 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 in, in dutch but they are done by the broil school mm-hmm. and you can just get a sense of the stench of these mm-hmm. places which must have been in every major market town till mm-hmm. she describes one uh i would be I like think 18th century 18th century, uh, 18th century. At a time of growing yeah uh sanitization of major public places and of course without using the phrase meat market and getting us from <laughs> oh, the shambles <laughs> to only fans that um, was really good i did not see that coming um she very elegantly managed to avoid what i kind of officially am throwing out there she gets us f- via adam smith's theory of moral, the moral sentiments, sentiments. Uh, and of the invisible hand of the marketplace working together to, you know, digital romance today. And we will not spoil her essay by telling you what she concludes, but there are a few things that we would like to talk about because it relates to our overall theme of creatureliness. Creatures, are we human creatures um, or are we just uh, digital uh, phantasms that you swipe left or swipe right on? Now, some people are going to already be protesting quietly, I think. Well, I found the love of my life on a digital dating site. Possibly not only fans. Although, who is? Very knows? likely. No, that is unlikely. <clears throat> but possibly uh, on some other dating yeah. site. And she, which Mary Harrington might point out is perhaps not entirely different, at least in its structure, if not in the personal um, moral intentions of those people who are participating on it then only fans um yeah she she basically is making a kind of a case that the way that we start to look at each other um when we encounter each other in the sort of dating market primarily as disembodied products on a screen is perhaps not the greatest possible way to um think of each other and to begin to enter into a, what might be hopefully is a lifelong uh, loving relationship. And she just, I think she's just kind of like wanting us to start getting pretty troubled about that. That's the sense that I got with the piece. In what sense does that digitization, that sanitization, that removal of the marketplace from the blood and the guts, so to speak, uh-huh. um, that makes romantic life sound really horrible doesn't it yeah but at what sense is the removal of the marketplace from sort of the embodied 
nature of human life mm -hmm. actually decrease our ability to kind of see each other for what we are, to really mm -hmm. uh, love each other. Mm -hmm. um, to what extent do we instead become a bunch of attributes that are more or less desirable? Right. And I mean, I think that she also talks about the, I mean, she talks about the sort of deep history of um, companionate marriage almost and the way that um, we might think of like the the bargains that people make with um, in entering into families. And she, I know she's not like, she's not, and she talks about Jane Austen in this, in this, this context. She's not entirely like romanticizing past um, ways of doing the business of mating. Um, but she is just asking, essentially wanting to know how we can avoid, I think, dehumanizing each other um, and making each other into uh, accessories, like making the person that you're with essentially into an accessory of yourself. Well, I find it really troubling. And, and I mean, I so living in a community, it's something that we have thought a lot about. I live in the Brewerhof community, as probably many of you know. An Anabaptist community, we do have, you know, I do use Twitter occasionally. Uh, it's not in a sort of Amish rejection of all technology, but there is something about not just romantic, romantic sites, but also social media in general. And in fact, about the publishing world in general, that is very much about personal brand, personal platform. Mm -hmm. And it's actually at war with what we in a community, a Christian community, such as the Rudolph, are, are trying to live for, mm -hmm. uh, where you're not interested in a person as a person, but in, it's very easy to become influenced in a person as a brand. Right. Uh, as somebody who has a lot of followers or who is witty or has put out a certain persona of themselves. And that's actually fundamentally at odds and i'm not saying that you know i'm not at all saying that twitter is evil or or social media are per se evil but there is a dynamic to it that is fundamentally at odds with emptying yourself mm -hmm. um with honoring the last being first and the first being last because on twitter kind of the the first are first first are first yeah. it's a very uh, we were talking about Darwin last time. It's a very social Darwinistic kind of world. Right. And you see that in publishing world too, right? Where book publishers will only sign authors, not because they're coming right well, but one of the first things they're going to look for is what is their social platform. Right. And there's something very fundamentally at odds with Christianity in that. Right. And I mean, the other thing that Mary kind of gets into a little bit, which I thought was interesting, is the way that... Um, even at its best, even even in pre kind of um, you know dating app world, there was this kind of tendency, or there has been um, for the past couple of hundred years at least, this tendency to sort of see men and women as um, essentially out for, like each one they're either in competition with each other or they're you know each one pursues his or her own interest and they somehow through this kind of like um, Mandevillian self-interested um, pursuit of something or other end up coming together as a couple. and But that's not really what couplehood is. That's not what love is. That's the, the sort of pursuit of your own self-interest. Um, you know, private vice does not conduce to public virtue ever and certainly not in a marriage. Um, and yeah, I, I think that her... Uh, her discussion of that kind of like capitalistic understanding of what men and women look for in each other does make it sort of seem as though the, I don't know, the incel culture of um, that's very cynical about what women look for in men and essentially t would, would talk about marriage as legalized prostitution. Um, there's something that that is getting at in the way that we... Um, that more mainstream people um, maybe think, but aren't as open about in saying. And I think that that in itself is um, pretty demented. So I'd actually like to 
look at Murray's piece from the other end of the telescope. And I'm not sure if this will work, Susanna. Mm -hmm. But we could probably, and she does a beautiful job of kind of exploring and teasing out some of these aspects of, of modern life in her essay. But I'd like to get back to actually where she started, which is back to the shambles, mm -hmm. uh, because it relates to our core theme of, of, of creatures. And to what extent is it that we're unable to read the book of nature to experience life as creatures and to see mm -hmm. the world around us as created beings? Because we moderns have sanitized the world around us to such a great degree that we're not actually kind of, you know, we, we don't have the, the smell of the creatures on us mm -hmm. anymore. Um, we're not as as we've discussed we're not, not living on farms Pe number of people who hunt and fish have gone down mm -hmm. uh, people can't see the Milky Way uh, many people apart from pets obviously which mm -hmm. remain you know a, 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 a big source of companionship with creatures uh, for, for, for millions people aren't really at, as at home in the natural world as they more you know naturally would have been Mm -hmm. 100 years ago and that's not just to say that everything was better back then but i do think it has made it harder for people to feel at home mm -hmm. in nature and then to feel at home as being for for example a member of a species that is carnivorous mm -hmm. and that slaughters things and eats them and uh, doesn't see that as icky as yeah, yeah. As, as as aesthetically disgusting yeah I, I do think that like the weightiness of the act of killing animals um the thing that sort of her piece right at the beginning kind of put me in mind of was i, I again c.s lewis points out i can remember reading this that the temple in jerusalem was essentially a public abattoir like the the a number of animal sacrifices that went on there every day um, both first and, in both first and second temple um, Judaism were just staggering. Like there were a lot of animals that were being killed, and there and these were very very morally weighty actions, obviously. And there are you know actions that God wasn't just okay with, but prescribed. Like you had to kill the animal, and then you know at the Passover you had to eat it. So read Mary's piece, read which Mary's piece. is fantastic and lands in a very different place than you might imagine when it started it certainly <laughs> isn't a f finger wagging uh exercise in moralism but now we'll turn to another topic uh one of my favorite pieces in our issue <laughs> written by leah labresco a plow contributing editor called let the body testify and this is going to go a little deeper into the mm. question of what it means to have uh a created body but now we're going to talk about people right so Leah um, I guess one way to go into this is can you just describe a little bit what the argument of your piece was and how you kind of came to write it absolutely so as you know and I think readers of Plano I've been interested for a while in what we learn from our dependence and our weakness um, I have a substack community other feminisms that's kind of focused on this question because often in our kind of society focused on autonomy, we treat our periods of strength as though that's when we're really us and periods of sickness, age, pregnancy as exceptional cases, you know, moments where we become less ourselves, but hopefully we move on and recover from them quickly. Uh, so I wrote one piece for Plow uh, that was an essay just called Dependence on this subject, but I'm really fascinated in how how we kind of grapple with the reality of the body and how much we're able to ignore in the service of really defending this lie that the human being is at its core an autonomous person, someone who doesn't suffer, who doesn't need, except in exceptional circumstances. So this piece is really all about the different ways we find of ignoring that truth. And it starts with one that was startling for me to encounter, which is just that there are a lot of very politicized debates over when babies can feel pain in the womb. And they're politicized because they touch, obviously, for everyone, you know, whatever side you're on, on the question of abortion. 
But what you would think would be a less controversial question, whether babies can feel pain after they're born, was something where medical doctors ignored this because the babies were small, because the babies couldn't articulate their pain in the way a grown-up could, and went through operations without anesthesia sometimes because their pain wasn't legible or real to the doctors who treated them. And I see that as kind of a microcosm of this question of trying to make bodies invisible or unheard when they deviate from our expectations. Mm -hmm. We spent a lot of time talking earlier, um, I don't don't know, in past episodes and a little bit earlier today about the question of the legibility of the world and the legibility of creation, reading creation like a book. Um, And one of the cases that you make is that we need to be able to sort of like uh, read, especially not ignore the bodies that are there um, and attend to the bodies that are there. And you talk a little bit about the way that um, kind of many aspects of contemporary society are a little bit geared against the legibility of women's bodies or being able to um, read women's bodies as normal, non-problematic, not you know, not things that need to be managed um, because they're like chaotically potentially pregnant. Um, there's there's a very kind of like, um, there's an impulse to tame, it seems to me, especially women's bodies in, in the contemporary world. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, to tame, to kind of reshape, uh, to make them fit more easily a world that isn't necessarily attentive to them. You know, I really like the author Caroline Criado Perez, who you know has written an entire book on this way the world is not built to accommodate women. You know, everything from the the way that a, a tool is often sized for a male hand, and women may struggle to hold it comfortably, and then kind of have ourselves cast as weak or incompetent when we just need a tool that's sized for our hand as it is. You know, she even has a newsletter where every week she kind of keeps track of things that don't take into account women's bodies, whether it's psychological or medical studies that include zero women in their sample and then imply the result is generalizable to all people, or whether it's something as strange as a male entrepreneur who was developing period gloves for women to wear you know, while dealing with menstrual problems, because he just imagined that probably everyone needs special gloves to deal with that. And, and I think that really points to the fact this isn't all malice. It's negligence. It's a lack of curiosity about the range of people God has made and a willingness to live a siloed life where you don't encounter people different from yourself to realize that their needs are different than yours. I experience this most strongly as women. I think women are often the largest single group that gets left out. It's amazing to have half of everyone left out in this way. But people who suffer from disabilities, people who are old, all have these kinds of experiences because we build our world very narrowly for a shockingly small minority of people to navigate comfortably. And then we blame others for not navigating this world that is not tailored to their needs. I mean, the the way that I have been thinking about this most in the past couple of years is uh, as part of the conversation that you and I have both very much been engaged with um, kind of the question of liberalism and post-liberalism. And um, if you sort of dig back into the OG liberal uh, writings of John Locke, for example, you really start to get the sense that like the paradigmatic human being is an adult man who's around 35, who is physically fit and who has, you know, a certain amount of um, private income, probably a servant. I mean, and that that is the sub, he is the subject. He is the person who, um, uh, who is the, who's the, who's the paradigmatic human being and that other human beings um, exist as kind of defective versions of him. And the, I, I can't remember the philosopher who said it, but like he, there was some like line about the liberal philosophers are childless men who've forgotten what it's like to be a child because the bizarre concept of um, every uh, sort of the, the, bizarre, the bizarre premise of liberalism um, that, you know, every um, everything that we own is something that we come into property because we have mixed our labor with the property. Um, gifts are not the paradigmatic example of property. What is worked for is the paradigmatic example of property. This does not work with a species that starts out as a completely dependent uh, 
creature. And ends that way, unless, you know, if we're lucky, you end that way also completely dependent. Yeah, I think, you know, this, this idea of the liberal man as someone who's autonomous, um, someone who I'd agree with your description, but I'd add who has a wife who takes care of some of these things and who isn't the liberal subject herself, you know, it's kind of an accessory or a prop for the liberal man. Uh, it's really toxic and poisonous. It's embedded in a lot of our institutions, even if we like some of the other work they're doing. I was just reading today, the, the number of places we kind of bring this contempt is what really strikes me, because there was a, a lovely essay in um, Aeon, Aeon, I don't know how they pronounce that magazine, to be honest, uh, Aeon, uh, How to Do Philosophy for and with Children, uh, by Jana Mo Moore Lane. Um, and what she was saying is just that we, we treat children as though they will become people at some point, kind of the same problem I was talking about with the babies and the doctors, but just for their ability to grapple with ideas or interesting questions. And she cites you know, the cognitive scientist, Alison Gopnik, saying that we treat children like they are defective adults, that they're going to blossom into liberal subjects at some point. Now I'm going beyond what Gopnik is saying, because she's not making a political critique in this way. But we see them not as part of what it means to be human, but as people who are in the process of becoming human. And it's that idea I really want to push back against. You know, in the womb, in old age, you know, covered in mud as a six-year-old, each of these people is human. This is a portrait of what it means to be human at this particular age or this particular stage, not a journey on the way to becoming a human. How does that, I mean, I absolutely agree with that, but it's also a little bit in tension, at least in my head, with the idea of teleology and the idea that we actually do, it is good for us to grow up into adult men and women who then go on to form families of our own. Like that is a good um, telos for us. It is good to grow up. It isn't technically speaking necessary. That's not the, the fullness of what we grow up into. We grow up into being the image of Christ and the image of who he asks us to be. You know, and some people image Christ in their weakness, you know, in his willingness to become man for us and to undergo all the degradations of a human body, you know, the worst of what death has to offer. Some people image Christ in their suffering, and some people don't become verbal even as adults and are still full images of Christ. They're imaging perhaps a different part of Christ than you are, Susanna, but we do have a telos, but it's to holiness, you know, not to even to wholeness as we might think of it in terms of what we expect an adult to look like. Let's talk about suffering a little bit. One of the really fascinating parts of your piece was the idea that we learn how to suffer, that there's a certain amount of like free floating, especially psychological, as you could probably say, suffering that gets expressed in different ways in different cultures. Um, and you use the example of anorexia. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, this is drawn from a book called Crazy Like Us by a man named Ethan Waters. And he's, he's a controversial guy, but I found his arguments persuasive. He's really looking at what it looked like to export the American understanding of anorexia and of difficulties for young women to other parts of the world where scientists and sociologists with the best intentions in mind went looking for a disease that didn't necessarily exist in other parts of the world. He's looking particularly at China and then would kind of do awareness raising campaigns about anorexia, which were followed by a spike in anorexia. And you can tell two stories about this. One is there was a hidden epidemic and they uncovered it. And the other is they tutored girls in how to cope with the difficulties of adolescence, how to give voice to whatever difficulties they were going through. And the language they taught to express that difficulty was anorexia. And you make a connection between that and potentially the sort of um, spike, similar spike in um, gender dysphoria among young women these days, like, which also seems to be in some way socially contagious, in some way, um, like I, I think the figures were um, up until recently, seventy-five percent of people with gender dysphoria were men, and or and at this point, it's like seventy percent uh, young women. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that, or like that's? I think you have to ask the same question in both cases. Are you uncovering a hidden epidemic that's been there the whole time, you know, which is the claim you could make about gender dysphoria or anorexia in China, or? Are you to a certain extent taking people at a vulnerable age where they're looking for ways to 
have a language to cope with what's going on with their bodies, especially for girls to cope with a world that's very hostile to women. Uh, that's going to, in a sense, punish them for going through puberty, for their changing bodies as they receive catcalls, as they receive bullying or harassment from boys or men in their life. And are you offering them a way out of that or a way of expressing their dissatisfaction with that that speaks to a real need, doesn't give a full answer to it? You also talked a little bit about a book that's kind of been I don't know, I feel like it's been haunting this issue of the um, of the magazine, which is Carter Sneed's recent um, What It Means to Be Human, The Case for the Body in Public Bioethics. And you talk about Sneed's uh, discussion of the ideology of expressive individualism, especially as it has to do with childbearing and um, the choices that we make about our bodies. Can you talk about that a little bit? It's a stellar book is what I want to say first. So. <laughs> You know, everyone else, pause the recording for just a moment, order it from your local bookshop, invite a friend to read it with you, set up a book club. It's, it's an extraordinary book. I'm halfway through the year. It's going to be one of the best books I read all year. I'm sure of that. And what Sneed is really looking at is what do we ground our sense of dignity and identity in? He's looking at it through the lens of bioethics and the law. But this is a question that touches on everyone, even if you don't think of yourself as a bioethicist or a lawyer. And of course, everyone's a bioethicist when you're sick or you're caring for a family member who's facing dis difficult choices. So it's a book that's relevant to everyone. And he draws this contrasting view between the, the dignity coming from our ability to reason and to will versus our dignity coming from the fact that we have bodies and that those bodies are vulnerable. And in the one case, that's the autonomous idea, the idea that only some people are fully people and that it's a, a real crisis whenever you fall off that level of autonomy, that you, you need to be restored to it or you're kind of only a half person for a while, versus the idea that there's a dignity in need. It's not something we escape. It's something we just experience at varying degrees during our life. And that the point of bioethics, the point of medicine, the point he extends it to of human community is to be an answer to that vulnerability, an answer that respects it and prizes the person and doesn't seek to excuse or ignore vulnerability. And you also kind of go on from there to look at Sarah Zhang's, is that how you pronounce it, a piece in The Atlantic about um, basically what it does when we start to screen for Down syndrome um, the way that that becomes a kind of like, th that then having a child with Down syndrome becomes a kind of almost like a thing that you've chosen in a, in a, in a way that expresses part of your identity, that expresses like almost the way that you might choose a car. Like this, this um, the fact that I've chosen to have this child with Down syndrome says something about me, or the fact that, I cho that I've chosen to abort this child says something about me. Um, do you want to go on and, uh, and talk a little bit about how how she goes into that? Yeah, you know, I think she's describing something that these parents experience as a real hardship because they feel like for their whole life and for their child's whole life, their child's Down syndrome is a comment about what the parent wanted for them as a child. They feel pressure mm -hmm. because the universal screening makes them feel guilty, you know, that everything hard in their child's life is something the parent has opted into to an extent mm -hmm. by carrying their baby to term. No, and we don't feel that way about other hardships in the same way. You know, if your child, God forbid, were in a car accident and suffered severe injuries, paralysis, cognitive difficulties, no one would look at you and say, you chose that for your child. You made a choice to have your child live this life that's marked by these vulnerabilities and difficulties. But universal screening and abortion leaves parents feeling as though in some sense this might be their fault because they said yes to it when they said yes to their particular baby. And so some of the parents yeah. she talks about say they'd feel more comfortable if they hadn't known because they still love their child, but then they wouldn't feel like they, you know, as they experience it, were the cause of the difficulties their child faces. Right. I mean, the idea of the choice to have a child uh, really starts to sound quite a bit more sinister when you, I just, I kind of wanted to read this paragraph just because it was quite haunting to me. The model of expressive individualism sanctifies nearly every any choice. In this framework, abortion is liberation for both mother and child. The Planned Parenthood slogan, every child a wanted child, confers a, a peculiar dignity on survivors of a pro-choice world. Unlike their aborted brothers and sisters, they were chosen. So the idea of um, 
just that kind of like there's it, it's almost a, a massive uh, um, it's almost a pre-birth meritocracy in a way which is chilling at least to me and I think this is often how advice to women is framed during pregnancy even when it's not explicitly about abortion it's that you know the food you eat the experiences you have you're making choices about your child you're making them into a particular kind of person and anything that goes wrong for your child medically or is hard for your child is going to be your fault and it's going to be in some sense an expression of you and I, I really admire Emily Oster's um, writing on this in her book on pregnancy, Expecting Better, because she talks about this really in a different framework, neither of Sneed's, I would say, just saying that our life is about balancing risks. It's not about mm -hmm. avoiding all danger or avoiding all bad outcomes. It's about thinking about what it costs us to avoid them and making healthy, sane choices. So she's she's not someone slapping food out of a woman's hand when she's pregnant saying like, have you considered everything that might be in that? A friend of mine had a pregnancy book that said, with every bite you take, consider if this is the best choice you could make for your baby. And I, I think that really goes back to a fear of children's potential. What if your child isn't what you hope for? Aren't you obliged to do everything possible to prevent that versus are there ways to be comfortable accepting your child as the person they are and just accepting and really growing into the particular relationship they have with you? I've been fascinated to just listen to your conversation <laughs> and I will butt in because it, this last this last comment you just made, Leah, there's been a lot of coverage in the last few weeks about the falling fertility uh, levels in our country, but around the world. Um, really bad in the United States, but then there's countries like South Korea where it's actually a, a 0.9 oh when gosh. replacement rate is 2.1 or so. Right. Um, and I've often wondered too, could that not be a big contributing factor, this uh, idea that every child has to be an expression of my best self. And mm -hmm. if, it, if the, he or she is not, it's a failure on me as a parent. It mm -hmm. creates an actual, actually impossible burden on parenthood. Mm -hmm. um, and I have no idea, you know, if this can be verified in statistics or not. But it does seem to me that there is a much higher expectation that rather than the child just being whoever got born, is that's your child. Yep. Um, now that child is uh, an expression of, of me that before birth and then also after birth mm -hmm. has to continually be molded um, not towards just holiness, as you said earlier, Leah, uh, but to towards success, uh, however defined. Um, child as a product. And I mean, I think that this is something that obviously we're going to be seeing a lot more of as the biotechnology becomes, um, it becomes more and more possible to do things like CRISPR babies, but much, much, much more so. Um, and I think that it's something that it seems to me that, um, I don't know, there's, it seems like there's an entirely different way of thinking about, um, about childbirth and about bearing children. Um, and as you were talking just now, Leah, I was remembering a piece that our friend Gracie Olmstead wrote, and I can't remember whether it was for Plow or for Breaking Ground. It was for Plow. It was for Plow. Okay, there we go. Um, the uh, Risk of Gentleness. The Risk of Gentleness. And it was about this kind of, she had a, a surprise pregnancy at the right at the beginning of COVID. And the way that like pregnancy is, it's not something passive. It's not that you're, it's not that you're not um, active. It's that it is something that you receive and it is fundamentally a gift and it's something that you are um it's not an expression of your will you don't need to this is all autonomic nervous system stuff this is you don't need to like worry about making your child's kidneys properly and thinking through to make sure that you don't screw that up um and i i wonder whether there's a way that we can like reboot ourselves to start thinking of children as gifts as opposed to products and like how how it is that we do that and i also wondered whether you wanted to talk about your daughter a little bit because i think she's pretty cool she's she's excellent um but you know, i think i think a lot of this goes back to the anxiety about you know precarity in our society the sense that if we don't give our children the very best and prepare them for a meritocracy they won't make it, that they'll slide backwards from where we are. And that's a real fear, you know, that a lot of 
parents are facing. College is more expensive, housing is more expensive, careers are not as stable. So when I say that I want parents to kind of take a step back from this fearful approach to children, I recognize that that's harder to do for people who are parents now than for our own parents, um, that it feels like there are fewer second chances, fewer avenues up and out uh, for people. And I think the answer to that fear is a healthier society, a more humane economy that'll be a while in coming, even if we all start working on it now. So to an extent, you know, it's being comfortable with the idea that some things may disadvantage your child economically or socially, and that that price is worth paying to convey to them what their essential dignity is rooted in. You know, we see more and more college students who are heavily anxious, again, not without reason, given the lives they lead and the pressures they face. So it is that trade-off of you know, do you want your child to go to the best school they might be able to get into if they push themselves all through high school, even all through middle school? Or do you want something less for them in the eyes of the world, but more for them in terms of who they know they are and what their life is centered on? One of the things I do try and do for Beatrice is just make it normal for her that she struggles with things. It's, it is normal for a baby, but we don't treat it as normal for an adult. And that leads grown-ups to not take chances, not take on hobbies, not take on difficult friendships, uh, not extend themselves in charity. If we're used to the idea of being a grown-up, of being an autonomous person, is feeling good at everything we do. I want my daughter to do things she's bad at. I, I need her to do it right now because she's bad at fairly important things like you know eating soup with a spoon. And I want her to get better at that over time. But I want her to not be discouraged by doing things she isn't excellent at for her whole life. It seems like the, the phenomenon of experiencing oneself as made in the image of God, uh, experiencing oneself as having been given to one's parents by God is probably more important than being genetically um, modified to be like optimized. I think that's kind of where we might be coming out on this. That, that might be a, like an editorial position of this magazine. I think we could establish that as a strong editorial position of our magazine. Yeah, okay. I'm really intrigued, uh, Leah, by what you say about letting Beatrice uh, struggle and be bad at things. Uh, I think there's this book, The Cult of Smark, by, Fre by Freddie DeBoer, um, which I'm intrigued by. I've, I've only read part of it, but I love reading his blog. And it seems to me that uh, so much of it has to do also with parents being okay with their kids being kind of mediocre, right? And that's okay. They're a human being. <laughs> uh -huh. um, they're a beloved human being that can love other human beings. Uh -huh. You know, and you know, I, after my son is now a seventh grader, and I have no idea what he's going to be. I mean, he's not. You know, he's not struggling that hard, but he's he's not gonna. He's not going to be a 1% of the meritocracy, probably. Hopefully he doesn't listen to this. But, uh, <laughs> but he might be a really good carpenter, right? Uh -huh. And we have to... How do we get to a society where that's just fine? Mm -hmm. Because if you're a loving human being who's good at being with other human beings, how you rank out on that meritocracy mm -hmm. um, really doesn't matter. The fact is... For a lot of kids, it does matter. And that's what gets at parents now, mm -hmm. right? Is that it makes a big difference it, it, whether they'll find a spouse later down the road, um, what kind of friends they'll mm -hmm. have, whether they can raise their own kids with even that much choice, right? Mm -hmm. So, And this is, this is the struggle. Mm -hmm. um, you can't just go tell people, well, ignore it all now. Uh -huh. I kind of think well, I, I want think to... This is more of a struggle the more you live and expect to live in an intensely socially, economically intelligence stratified community so that you know what levels you achieve on any of those are deciding who your friends are deciding who you meet and there's something i do admire a lot about the bruderhof that there's a real range of people when i come visit you um, a range of people all brought together by a common way of life rather than a single level of excellence in one domain it's something that was always when I lived in DC so different about when I went to mass than when I did almost literally anything else socially in the district that at mass I saw a much broader range of people a broader range of ages versus kind of just seeing other 20 somethings like me when I lived there 
a range of abilities and genetic conditions versus, again, in the offices I was in, I wasn't likely to meet someone with Down syndrome, and I did at church, you know, and a range of excellences. And I think without some part of your life, and hopefully more and more of your life, where you're brought together with people who are different to love them as they are, the more anxiety it's natural to have about the meritocracy and everything else, because it determines everything else about your life. So the answer is actually a stronger and more vibrant church. More, mm-hmm. more places where you meet the person with Down syndrome uh-huh. and where they meet other people uh-huh. and where, you know, the stockbroker and the plumber and the homemaker and, you know, the woman who cleans bathrooms at the gas station um, really are all eye to eye. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's kind of what the kingdom of God is meant to be like. And it's to an extent an argument against the kind of intensely filtered affinity groups some churches make to create community of, okay, all the singles who are under 30 in this group, and when you graduate, then there's no more hope for you, and you have to kind of float around to see what you can join, and then one group for mothers, and possibly something for men every other month in case men like having friends, but we're not sure, you know, that that kind of intense (laughs) filtering. (laughs) I mean, I do think the other thing to think about, which you touch on in your piece as well, is the way that um, how this looks at the end of life, because just as much as, um, you know, choosing to have a child who has Down syndrome becomes a kind of expressive individualistic choice that says something about your personality, as there's, you know, an increased kind of normalization and, and indeed pressure towards euthanasia, it seems like insisting on staying alive is also going to be seen as like this weird expressive individual choice creating Um, an imposition yeah it's like why are you why are you doing this like what is your what are you saying like and and i you know at the same time i think that there's going to be a great temptation um to kind of create kind of customized deaths that say something like really beautiful about your you know read a little khalil gibran and um you know toast with some really excellent white wine with your friends before you you know take the pill or whatever it is um and it seems like especially important because you know as christians we kind of do think that death is one of the most important things that we do it's a little bit like graduation um it seems particularly important to sort of try and figure out what it means to be a full human being um and not like use your own old age as an avenue of expressive individualism. Well, I, I think this um, is what's hard, having a lot of parts that are normally part of life turned into choices that have to be justified. You know, that communities that have introduced assisted suicide and have made the qualifications very broad suddenly mean that choosing to live is a question you have to actively consider and perhaps justify, especially in the face of a society that's happy to help you die, but not to support you in your dignity and needs while you're alive. But, you know, the same pressure is kind of there for women in the age of the pill, where a child is always supposed to be an active, considered choice. And I loved Gracie's essay on that not being true for her. And that means that, you know, to an extent, you're expected to be able to justify any children you have, no matter what their condition, but the timing is supposed to be justifiable. It's all supposed to be part of a good, considered decision rather than just a thing that happens in marriage. Well, Leah, thank you so much for uh, talking with us. It's been a blast. And uh, yeah, we're very happy to have you on. And if you'd like to hear more of this conversation, please join Leah, as we certainly will, in a conversation with another Plow Editor, Mariana, right on June 23rd at 8 o'clock Eastern Time. June 23rd, that's a Wednesday. We'll drop a link in the program notes. And there she'll uh, have discussion and I believe answer questions from readers on her essay for Plow that we've just been discussing. And this is going to be a new format for us. This is sort of like live letters to the editor. It is on Zoom. Um, And so yeah, drop on by, tell us what you think. Thanks, I'm really Leah. looking forward to it. It's going to be, it's going to be so fun. Looking forward to it. Yeah, good, good. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye, Leah. Bye, guys.